you so much. Well, y'all can be seated. We're packed out in here, aren't we? How are y'all doing? Do you know how much I love you? I feel like we're family. It's just that y'all talk funny, you know? <laughs> That's the only difference. I, I don't know how many times I've been coming here, but I just love you to pieces. We've already had church, haven't we? I, I just crack up listening to the two of them, the accents. I just, I just kind of forgot I was about to come up here because I just love listening to them. It just, it just gets me. I, but, you know, I was going to tell you real quick, we brought some friends. I have two friends who've never been to England before. Yay! So, Elena and Lucy, would y'all stand? This is their first time. <laughs> And then my friend Sandy, she's from New York City. She's been here before, but yes. And then Donna, who's been working with me for 19 years. Yay! And Donna was born in Jamaica, but grew up in London. Isn't that amazing? And then God sent her to Dallas, Texas, so <laughs> to be with me. I want you all to know what we have done in one day. You want to hear this? In one day, we went to Buckingham Palace, saw the changing of the guard, went to Parliament, went to Kensington Palace, had tea and scones, went to the London Tower Bridge and the Tower of London. Then we got on a boat ride on the Thames River, not the Thames River, and then... <laughs> And then we got, um, we got into a riot because the Brexit thing was going on. So we saw, <laughs> yes, we saw the riot. We were right in the middle of it. But you know, the funny thing is people were yelling and they're mad and they're angry. But your accent is so pretty. It sounded nice. <laughs> I was like, oh, how sweet. And they're like, no, they're mad. <laughs> but, um, but there's one place I have not taken my friends. Do you know? Primark! <laughs> so I was going to ask y'all, are they open on Sunday? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. I'll take you there later. <laughs> they have no idea what they're in for, do they? <laughs> yeah. So, well, I'm a cheerleader of dreams. I don't know if you know that. And I believe that as long as you have a heartbeat, you have a purpose. So I want to encourage you today. I told Pastor Joe, I'm just here to give you a pep talk and to just remind you to stop looking at all the years you've lost. Let's look at the years you've got left. Amen? So I want you to know you're in the right place. You know, there was a man in America named Aristotle Onassis. Have you ever heard of him? He was worth $500 million. And he used to say what he would do if he lost his fortune. He said, if I lost all my money, I would go get a job. He said, I would get three jobs and work as hard as I could just to save up $500. And he said, I would take all $500 and spend it on one expensive meal in the nicest restaurant in the city. People said, you would spend all your money on one meal? He said, yes, just to get in the environment of people who would cause me to come up higher. Isn't that amazing? That's how important it is that you stay in this kind of a faith environment that causes you to think bigger, to dream bigger, to believe bigger. So you're in the right place at the right time. You believe it? So I'm just going to share with you a simple message today, and I want to remind you of this. Every time you come to church, every time you make yourself get up and hear a faith-building message, you know, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, right? You're getting stronger every time. And, you know, they say the key to success, I just happen to have a key here, is uh, <laughs> it's K-E-Y, keep educating yourself. Keep educating yourself. That's the key to success. So my message today, I call this the three bones of success. The three bones of success, and I do have the bones here. So <laughs> are you ready? Okay, the first set of bones I want to talk about is the bare bones. Just the bare bones. Now, that's a phrase that we use to describe the essentials, the elements, the basics of day-to-day -day life. 
So what I mean by that is what are the bare bones of your daily routine? Like, what are you doing on a day-to-day basis that's going to lead you closer to your dreams or further from them? Because the secret of your future is in your daily routine. You know, some of you know that, um, well, let me just tell you this real quick. I used to set goals, New Year's goals. January 1st, I'd get out a piece of paper and I'd write all my goals down. And this is what my goals sounded like. Read more, lose weight, get closer to God, save money, get organized. Do those sound familiar? Well, I didn't know I was setting myself up to fail because vague goals produce vague results, right? So after a decade of not achieving any of my goals, I finally found the key to living my dreams. And it all has to do with what you do before breakfast, how you're spending your routine. In fact, you know, John Maxwell is one of my mentors. And I heard this story he shared about how he was speaking at a conference, and at the end, he agreed to do this Q&A with the audience. And he said there was this young man there who just graduated from university, and this young guy is just admiring everything about the conference. So I want you to think about it. There were 2,000 people in attendance who paid $2,000 each. I'm going to grab my pocket calculator and do some math, okay? So (laughs) 2,000 times 2,000, do you know what that is? $4 million in one weekend. So he said to John Maxwell, he said, "Um, I want to do what you do. Maxwell said, what do you think I do? He said, well, you speak at all these events, you write best-selling books, you impact lives. He said, I want to do what you do. And John Maxwell said, young ma'am, it's not a matter of doing what I do. He said, the question is, do you want to do what I did so you can do what I do? Now, here's my point. You can't have a million-pound dream with minimum wage habits. You know? You can't have a million-pound dream with minimum wage habits. Well, I didn't know that. And, you know, just to kind of give you my backstory, you know, some of you may follow our ministry or you've seen me here through the years. God's done such amazing things in our ministry and I feel like David, like the least likely person, because I know I don't look like a preacher. I don't sound like one. I don't even sound like an adult, much less. (laughs) I know. I think the Lord uses me to give people hope that, dear God, if Legally Blonde can do it, we can all do it. (laughs) But, you know, to appreciate what God has done, and I mean, phenomenal things. We were sharing in the car. Last year, we reached 21 million views on YouTube. Last year alone, we shipped books to 122 nations around the world. I mean, you know, we've had to hire more people. We had to get warehouses to store all the product. I mean, God has just totally blessed us, and I'm so grateful. But to appreciate what God has done, you have to know the backstory. So a few years ago, I would have been the most insecure person you would have ever seen. From a series of events I went through, some of you know my story, but at 14 years old, I was raped by a guy that I don't even know at a fitness center, at a gym. You know, to this day, if he saw me, he probably doesn't even know it's me. And when I went through that experience, it really impacted me on the inside. It completely changed the way I saw myself. I used to be just happy-go-lucky girl, and I still tried to, you know, have a big smile. I was a cheerleader all through school, but I was hiding so much pain. And because of that, I felt worthless. I felt ugly. I felt useless. And then I got into a relationship with a guy that became abusive, and I stayed with him because of how I felt about myself. And, you know, Everything from strangling me, throwing me on the ground, locking me in a car with him, banging my head on a steering wheel, and I stayed with him. Finally got out of that, trying to do what's right and, you know, try to build myself up. Then my last semester of college, I got pregnant before marriage. Most of you know my favorite preacher, my dad, Jerry Savelle, and I was so ashamed of myself. I ended up getting married, and three weeks after the wedding, I lost the baby, And so it just felt like one terrible thing after another. Even though good things did happen in my life, I just felt like such a failure. And in 2002, that's when I had my wake-up call. I finally looked at my life and realized I'm separated from my husband. 
I have debt. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. My house is a mess. I'm unhealthy. I have no vision for my life. And I have a five-year-old little girl who's looking to me for a role model. And I finally looked into my future and realized, unless I make a radical decision to change, this isn't going to be like a season of regret. This is going to be a life of regret. And all I did was make a decision. I didn't have a success coach come to the house and lay out a plan for me. I just made a decision. I said, I'm going to make myself do five things every day for 21 days. Just five things I wrote down. And I thought, you know, I'd heard if you do something consistently for 21 days, you can break a habit and start a new one. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this. Well, one of my five things was to make myself, and I know you've heard this, make myself listen to a faith-building message every day for 21 days. Well, if you're going to do something, you have to decide when you're going to do it, right? So I said, okay, well, I could do it in the morning while I'm getting ready for work. i got to get ready anyway. takes a long time to look like this. (laughs) Might as well. (laughs) So I, you know, got a a big CD player. I stole some of my parents' CDs. And I put this little post-it on the mirror, and it just said, push play. So I walked in there the first morning, and I saw, oh, yeah, push play. And I pushed the button, and I began hearing the Word of God, hearing the Word of God. And, you know, the, the cool thing about the Word of God is it changes you from the inside out. It's not like just having the TV on in the background. Well, God began to transform my self image as I began this little habit every day. Well, some of you have heard me say this, but that's when I heard John Maxwell make this statement. He said, if I could come to your house and just watch you for 24 hours, I can tell whether or not you're going to be a success or a failure. I thought, oh my gosh, how could he know? He said, you pick the day. Well, let me just watch you from the moment you wake up until you go to bed that night. He said, just by observing you in one full day, I can tell in what direction your life is going to go. And that's when he said, the secret of your future is hidden in your daily routine. The secret of your future is hidden in your daily routine. Well, when I heard John Maxwell say that, I thought, well, I'm not going to stop at 21 days. I'm going to go for a whole month. Then I thought, I'm not going to do a month. I'm going to do two months. Then I went for three months. Are you ready for this? That was in 2002. And I haven't stopped. This morning, I woke up in London, England, and I push play. The secret of your future. Isn't that amazing? And you know, what's wild is just a few years ago, I was moving into the most beautiful house I've ever lived in. I'd written six books by then. I was opening my own offices, hiring staff. God restored my marriage. We've been married 27 years. Isn't that amazing? And as I'm moving in my house, like we're carrying boxes in, and there was this precious young girl that we hired to come help get it all cleaned up, you know? And as I'm carrying boxes in, she just stopped me. She doesn't know me. And she said, ma'am, can I ask you something? I said, sure. What is it? She looked around the house, and she said, how do you get a life like this? And without skipping a beat, I said, your routine. If you'll change your routine, you'll change your whole life. And I'm telling you today, the bare bones of your daily routine is going to be the key that will lead you to your dreams. You know, I have a friend who, or actually, let me tell you this story. This is a guy named Jeff Arch who, he ran a karate school, and he said he was married, he had kids, but he just felt like something was missing inside. And he said one morning, he couldn't sleep, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, he turns on the TV and there's a motivational speaker. And he said, as he's watching this motivator, he said, I finally realized I'm not where I want to be in life. He said, how can I tell my kids to go after their dreams if I won't even go after mine? So he said, he sat there and he thought, you know what? I'm going to make a change. He said, I never wanted to run a karate school. I always wanted to write movies. I wanted to write scripts for movies. So he said, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I made two promises. He said, I'm going to purchase the coaching course that they're, at, that they're selling. He said, I'm going to invest in my future. So he put some money on the line. And he said, the second promise was, I'm going to make myself finish the course. I'm not going to get excited about the first lesson and not finish. I'm going to finish all the way through. Well, he said, when the coaching course arrived, he started with day one. And he did it again the next day. And he did it again the next day. Well, all of a sudden, he started getting inspiration to start writing again. 
He wrote a screenplay in less than one month. He sold it in less than three months for a quarter of a million dollars. That little screenplay went on to become a mega hit with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan called Sleepless in Seattle. Isn't that amazing? So he changed his routine and it changed his whole life, didn't it? So those are the bare bones. If you'll just start adapting, let me tell you real quick what the five things are. We don't have time to talk about it. But number one was I said, I'm going to make myself pray. Whether it's five minutes or 20 minutes, I'm going to spend time with God. Number two, I'm going to listen to a message, right? Push play while you're getting ready, while you're on that little tube or tube, whatever you call it. <laughs> just push play. Number three, I still don't know what y'all are saying. <laughs> Is it C-H-U-B-E? Tube? Tube. Oh, some of y'all sound like you're saying tube. Oh, okay. I guess. Okay. So the third thing was I said, <laughs> I'm going to make myself read. Now, some of you may have heard, when I, when I graduated from university, I made the dumbest announcement I've ever said. I said, I will never study again. For 11 years, I never read a book. And for 11 years, I was in debt, no vision, life falling apart. Finally, when I said I'm going to make myself read 20 minutes a day. Leaders are readers, right? Yes. Learn more to earn more. <laughs> the fourth thing was I said I'm going to start writing my dreams and goals, which I'll talk about right now. And the fifth was exercise, just in case y'all were wondering what the five were. Okay, you ready for the second bone? Yes. Yes. It's wishbone. Wishbone. Now, what I mean by that, of course, is vision. You've got to have a vision for your life. Now, if you've ever heard a message from me, you know I'm going to talk about vision, right? About your dreams and your goals. Now, the reason this is so important is because God's the one who said, where there is no vision, the people perish. You're just drifting away. You're just perishing on the inside. Well, God not only found it important to have a vision, but you also have to take the time to write the vision, right? with a Texas-sized pencil. Write the vision, make it plain on paper. Now, most of you know, if you've ever been to any success conference or you've read a success book, they'll tell you the importance of this, right? You can't keep your goals in your head. You have to take the time to write it down. So some of you have read the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, right? Do you remember in that book they did research on 500 millionaires? to find out, do you have anything in common that's made you so successful? Now, back then, they interviewed John D. Rockefeller, Alexander Graham Bell, Charles Schwab, um, Thomas Edison, the most successful people in the world back then. After interviewing 500 millionaires, they discovered every one of them have clearly defined written goals. Clearly defined written goals. Write the vision, make it plain, right? God's the one who came up with it. Well, you know, years ago, <clears throat> we were decorating our offices, and this girl who was decorating for me, I was over in France preaching, and she texted me, and she said, Terry, <clears throat> what do you want on this giant wall that your desk faces? I texted her back, and I said, I want a vision board. She texted me back, huh? I said, I want a giant vision board, because I want to put pictures and images of where I see the ministry going. Well, she found like a big cork board that nobody was using, you know, and she framed it and put it on the wall. Well, when I got back from France, I was like, oh, the offices are amazing. And I could hardly wait to start putting pictures on the vision board. Well, time was going by, time was going by, and I was just trying to get caught up on all my work, you know. I can't tell you how bad it bothered me. Every time I would look up from my desk and see nothing, and I'm convinced if you see nothing, you can expect nothing. If you see nothing in your future, you will be exactly where you are today, next year at this time. We don't want that, do we? Well, you know, God's the one who even asked Jeremiah. Do you remember when he said, Jeremiah, what do you see? What do you see? And Jeremiah began to tell him, you know, I see the branch of an almond tree blossoming in late winter. And then God said to him, I'm watching over my word to perform what you see, right? Yes. So God's asking you today, what do you see? Do you see your marriage restored? Do you see yourself getting married? Do you see yourself carrying a baby? 
Do you see yourself logging into your bank account and you see 5,000 pounds in your savings? Can you see it? Can you see yourself logging in and paying off that MasterCard? Can you see yourself when church is over, you, drive, you pull, get in your dream car and drive home? Yes. See, you got to see it on the inside before it shows up on the outside. And I like to kick it up a notch. I like to put pictures and images to my dreams. You know, some of you have heard how I've put all kinds of fake pictures in here. When I wanted to write a book, I went to the bookstore and I posed in front of the bookshelves as if I had a book there. I put it in my dream book and I wrote, I'm a best-selling author. Here's a funny picture. I put a fake picture of me and John Maxwell. This is totally fake. <laughs> and I'm acting like we're buddies. And I said, I speak at events with John Maxwell. I put pictures of financial goals in here. I put a picture of Oprah Winfrey in here. I put so many just fake pictures in here. But there's a principle in the Word of God that you become what you behold. You become what you behold. I don't have all my samples here, but I can show you a couple real quick. Here I am speaking at events with John Maxwell. That's a good one. This was last April. Here I am on stage with Oprah Winfrey. I mean, I'm just telling you. If you have a dream, you got to keep it before your eyes, right? And let me just say this real quick. Vision always comes first. Provision comes second. Vision always comes first. Provision comes second. You know, T.D. Jakes, y'all know who that is, right? He has a church in our city in Dallas. And he said when he was getting ready to build the big campus, the Potter's House, he went to the bank and he you know, was trying to get a loan to build the campus. And the bank told him, they said, we're not going to give you any money. They said, we need to see a seven-year plan on paper. So he said, all I did was go home and write a seven-year prophecy of what I saw in my spirit. He went back and handed him the vision, and they handed him $45 million. But the vision came first. The provision came second. Now, just to kind of put this, bring this down a level, I think about the time I was taking my daughter to school and we're in the little mommy drop off, you know, where you drop your kids off and she's jumping out of the car. And before she got out, she goes, mommy, hurry. I need a hundred dollars. Hurry, hurry. And I was like, excuse me, a hundred dollars. I said, for what? And she goes, mommy, I told you $65 for the volleyball shoes, 25 for camp and 10 for lunch. And I said, oh, when I heard the vision, I gave the provision. See, God's just not going to pour money down until you say, Lord, this is what I need. Here's the vision. And, you know, God wants you to keep those images in front of you. Y'all know who Joel Osteen is, right? Do you remember his dad, John Osteen? You know, years ago when John Osteen was in the hospital having open heart surgery, he told Joel, he said, Joel, I want you to go home and get my tennis shoes. (laughs) He was a petite man. (laughs) He said, (laughs) I just couldn't fit real shoes up here. But (laughs) he said, I want you to go home and get my tennis shoes and put them in the hospital. Because he said, that is my vision that I am going to walk out of this hospital. Isn't that awesome? And he even had a vision. He said, I'm going to go jogging again, too. And do you know he lived another 12 years after open heart surgery? But he had to keep his eyes on that vision. Well, what is your vision that you need to keep in front of you? You know, I have a, a, another couple that I know who, in fact, do y'all ever remember the TV show called The Love Boat? Yes. Do you remember that? That's funny. Um, so, <laughs> do you remember the captain of The Love Boat? Okay, he and his wife went through a painful divorce. Well, his wife would not give up on that dream of God restoring their marriage. They were married for seven years, went through a divorce, and to keep the vision alive, you know what she did? She said every day she would set the dinner table with two plates. And that was her vision that God is bringing my husband home and we will be restored. Four years went by. All of a sudden she hears a knock at the door. She opened it up and there's captain of the love boat, Gavin. And all she said to him was, come on in, your dinner's getting cold. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? And do you know, 
They have been married over 30 years now. But she had to keep that vision in front of her eyes, right? So what is your vision that you're, you're just saying, Lord, it looks impossible. It looks like it's never going to happen. But God's saying, kick it up a notch. Add pictures to your dream. Keep it in front of you. Take the time to write it down. Are you ready for the last bone? The final bone I have to pick with you. <laughs> this is a tough one. <laughs> this is backbone. It's going to take a lot of backbone, isn't it, to live your dream. Now, what I mean by this is you're going to have to fight for your dreams. I never like to give people impression that I just print little pictures and they just happen. <laughs> it's so cute. No, I have to fight for my dreams and you will too. In fact, the Bible says that a dream comes about with much business and painful effort. I don't like that scripture, but it's in there. <laughs> you know, y'all may have heard me say how years ago, I was just, it was when I was going through all that in 2002, separated from my husband. And I'm the type of person that just kind of keeps everything inside. I usually don't tell everybody what I'm going through until I get through it, you know? But I was at a breaking point. I went over to my dad's house and I just said, Dad, I just can't take it anymore. I just want to give up. And my dad looked at me and he said, Terry, the Savelles are not quitters. You understand me? He said, you're gonna get through this. And then he just kept telling me, he said, quitting is not in your blood. You are gonna make it. And I just kind of stared off into space and my dad said, what are you thinking? I said, I think I'm adopted. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I've had to learn to fight, okay? <laughs> and you will too, right? Now, Thomas Edison made this statement. He said, most of life's failures are those who didn't realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Most of life's failures are those who didn't realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Now, some of these brands <clears throat> you may not recognize. I'm not sure if they're here in England, but I think most of them are. Listen to this. Aunt Jemima, do y'all have that? Yes. That's syrup and pancakes and stuff? Okay. Syrup, not syrup. Okay, Aunt Jemima, she went bankrupt three times. <clears throat> Pepsi went bankrupt three times. Quaker Oats went bankrupt three times. <clears throat> Henry Ford went bankrupt five times. Wrigley's Gum went bankrupt three times. Walt Disney went bankrupt seven times before he built Disneyland. Never give up on your dream, right? I mean... And you know, you think about it, the very thing that you're going through is the very thing God can use to take you to a new level. Amen. When you really think about that, you know, I look at David in the Bible. David would still be a shepherd boy if it weren't for Goliath. Goliath was the very thing that was sent not to defeat him, but to promote him to a new level, right? So just look at your, whatever you're going through right now, going, wow, I must be getting ready for a whole new level. Amen. My favorite preacher, Jerry Savelle, says, when you feel like giving up the most, that's always an indication your breakthrough is just about to happen. Amen? Amen? <laughs> so I just want to close out with this little story. I think you'll like this story. This is about a little girl named Liz who, this is back in the 1980s, she grew up with a single mom. Her dad left when she was six years old, and her mom was working two jobs just to try to make ends meet. And here's Liz at home by herself all the time, and her mom was working two jobs, and her mom told her, she said, the reason I'm working all these jobs is because I'm believing I'm going to send you to college, to university. You're going to get a good job. You're not going to, you know, suffer like I have. And she said, and my dream is that one day you're going to take mama on a trip around the world. Wow. That was her dream, and she planted that dream in her daughter. Well, one day Liz is at home by herself, and her aunt came over. And her aunt said to her, she said, you know, you're at home by yourself all the time. I think you need to join the Girl Scouts. Do y'all know what the Girl Scouts are? Okay. She said, I want you to join the Girl Scouts so that it gives you something to do. As soon as she gets in the Girl Scouts, she finds out they have a contest. Whoever sells the most boxes of cookies 
wins a trip for two around the world. She said, that's all I needed to hear. <laughs> she thought, I am not going to have to wait till I go through university, get a good paying job. I am going to win this thing and take my mom on the trip of her lifetime. So she said she started selling those cookies. She went door to door in the apartment complex. So she would knock on the door and say, would you like to buy a box of cookies? And the people would say, no, thank you. She'd come back the very next day. Would you like to buy a box of cookies? <laughs> and she did this every single day. Well, finally, the apartment manager said they were getting so many complaints because every day she's like, would you like to buy some cookies? You know. So they said, Liz, honey, you can't do this anymore. They said, people are starting to get upset. But he said to her, what I will let you do is set up a little booth by the elevator and you can sell your cookies, but you can't go knocking door to door. She said, hey, this works out better. They're coming to me instead of me having to go to them. So she said she changed her sell strategy. She ironed her uniform and made it look beautiful. And when people would come to her, instead of saying, would you like to buy a box of cookies? She would say, would you like to invest in me? See, my dream is to take my mom on a trip around the world. My mom's working two jobs just so one day I can get a good paying job and take her on a trip. If I win this thing, I get to make my mom's dream come true. By the end of that sales pitch, people are crying, you know. <laughs> they said on average, people were buying a dozen boxes of cookies from her. She sold over 10,000 boxes crushed the record, won the contest. Now listen to this. After three to four years of selling all of these 44,000 boxes of cookies, people started hearing about her. Disney came to her and said, we want to make a film about you. But it wasn't like a movie you go watch. It was a training video to teach the Disney employees how to sell. The royalties from it went to Liz. She became a speaker at conferences. Her mom went from two jobs to one job. She took her mom on a trip around the world twice by the age of 13. Isn't that amazing? But I want you to... <laughs> but think about that. She had the bare bones, didn't she? Every single day, she was prepared to go set up her little booth and sell her cookies. She had wishbone. She had a vision to win this thing. It was much more than selling cookies. It was to make her mom's dream come true. And she had backbone. No matter how many rejections she got, she showed up the next day. So again, I want to remind you, a dream comes about with much business and painful effort. But when you feel like giving up the most... That's always your indication your breakthrough is just about to happen. Did you receive that today? Yes. Amen. <laughs> so, do you feel like the Lord is talking to you about some things? Yes. Are you feeling like, you know, maybe some of you felt like you're getting close to wanting to give up on something, but God's saying, don't you even think about giving up, right? Your breakthrough is just about to happen. I, I wanted to mention to you a few things we brought. However, how should we do this? Do you want to set it right here? Okay. Um, thank you, Lucy. Okay. Oh, thank you. Well, I spoke yesterday at a conference. Wow. <laughs> Got some goods here. Yeah. So I spoke yesterday at a conference. at um, It was at Westminster something chapel? Central Hall? Yeah. That was amazing. That was so pretty. But we accidentally sold all the bundles that we were bringing to you. <laughs> so we did manage to find a few. Uh, Y'all had some from last time I was here. I think there's eight of these. So this is a book I wrote called Dream It, Pin It, Live It, How to Make a Vision Board. Now, you don't just put pictures up and just expect it to happen. There are certain things you have to do to see that dream come to life, right? Yeah. One of them is, you know, the Bible says we serve a God who gives life to the dead and he speaks of non-existent things as if they exist. You got to call that dream forth, right? Yeah. So I teach you how to make a vision board, how to get clear on your goals and what to do while you're waiting. And then I have a little dreams and goals notebook here for you to put pictures and images of what you're believing for. Plus the audio book. I went in the studio and read the whole audio book. So you got the book, the audio book, and a dreams and goals journal. 
Does that sound good? <laughs> and what is this sale for? This is 40 pounds, but I think we reduced it to 20 pounds. So that's a good deal for you. I'd like to give you that one. Yeah. This gentleman right there, he said, that's mine. <laughs> he claimed it, didn't he? Yay. Yes. A few months ago, I ordered this from, a few months ago, I ordered this from the States for a friend, a yeah. uh, friend of mine. Uh -huh. So I'm getting it back. You got it back. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> okay, and this is my latest book called Five Things Successful People Do Before 8 a.m. Now, you don't have to do them all before 8 o'clock in the morning. My mom asked, can I do it all before 8 p.m.? <laughs> I said, yes, mama. It's just a matter of doing it, you know? So I'll teach you how to develop good habits in your life. Does that sound good? I think we only have eight of these. So this sells for 15 pounds. Oh my gosh, I'm not messing with him. Come on. <laughs> Dear Lord, what in the world? Oh my gosh. What? Can I touch it? Wow, look at this guy. I just want, wow. That was a little intimidating. <laughs> I thought he was going to pick me up. <laughs> oh, no. Wow. <laughs> Somebody's been doing their treadmill. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay, the last thing I have, um, and I think we have a few of these. Now, we put this together just for the trip to London, and let me just ask real quick. How many of you feel like God is dealing with you about a new beginning, like a transition. Oh my goodness, that's who I'm talking to. Okay, the Lord said to me years ago, this is when I first started those five habits. The Lord said to me, when I know you're ready, get ready. And I was like, what? And then he said it again, when I know you're ready, get ready. In other words, like Coach John Wooden said, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. You have to prepare now so when God brings you opportunities, you say, thank you, Jesus, I'm ready. Some of you, God told you to write a book, but you haven't written the book. So if God brought you a publisher today, you'd have to say, Lord, I'm not ready. So you got to start writing the book now. So when he brings a publisher, you say, thank you, Jesus, I was ready. Here's my manuscript, right? So this is how I got ready. In fact, this is a one-year coaching program that I put together based on the 12 areas that God dealt with me about getting ready. So there's one for every month of the year. So you're not overwhelmed. You just start with one month, and I kind of take you by the hand and walk you through it. So like one whole month, we just work on your goals. Start setting goals the right way. Get very specific. Don't say, Lord, I'm believing for more increase. You know I need more money. Well, here's 10 pounds and there's your increase, right? <laughs> no, you got to get specific. You got to say, Lord, I am believing God for a 10,000 pound raise or whatever it is, right? One whole month. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to have to wait because I'm not finished. <laughs> have a seat. Have a seat. So, but every single month, look at them. Every month, you, you know, I walk you through a process of how you get ready. One whole month, we work on cleaning your house. Did you know that's what the Lord told me before I could write a book? He told me, clean up the mess. And here's why getting your house cleaned up is so important. When you're faithful with the little things, you'll be ruler over many things, right? So God began to teach me how to get my house cleaned up. One whole month, we work on your finances. I guess the whole church wants free product. They're coming up. <laughs> no, but anyway, this is a one-year program. But what we did was this has 12 books. 12 audios, but what I did was I went in the studio and we put all of it on this little flash drive. And I did 12 videos that aren't included in that. So I put 12 videos on here also, one for every month just to give you extra content and teaching. But that's not all, wait, there's more. I added more. I put the five best-selling audios that we have, I put this on here. One of them is conquering procrastination. One of them is called you have not because you 
See, I just love to hear y'all say ask. <laughs> you have not because you ask not. <laughs> so I teach you how to start asking God for bigger things. Stop asking God to put gas in your car. Ask him to pay off the car. Right? And then I added a bonus CD called Focus. Now, this is something I taught at a success conference where people paid $400 each to come. And the reason I taught on focus is because the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So I teach you how to get focused on one goal at a time till you check them off. So if you feel like God's dealing with you about this one-year coaching program, we put all of it right here. Now, this is 500 pounds worth of product. And we reduced it just for you today, right before we leave, when we got to go, is 150 pounds. You get all of that content, all the bonus things we added, 150 pounds. And let me just say, you would easily spend that on clothing. Yes. That's right. This is your future you're talking about, right? Is your future worth 150 pounds? Do you know my library at home, to me, is the most valuable thing in my house? And don't get me wrong, I've got some amazing shoes. But, <laughs> but I'm just saying, the investment I've made in myself, the books, the courses, the audios, that's what's changed my life. So if you feel like God's speaking to you, my dad always taught me this, obey quickly and quietly. That's what dad would say, obey quickly and quietly. Because delayed obedience is still disobedience. And let me close out with this statement. Years ago, when I started changing my habits, I was listening to this message and I would drive to work and I heard this preacher say this statement two times and then the CD would end. This is what he said. Somebody in need is waiting on the other side of your obedience. And then he'd say it again. Somebody in need is waiting on the other side of your obedience. And I would think, could somebody be waiting on me to get my act together? And I'd think, no, nobody's waiting on me. Then I would think about it again. Now today, when I get testimonies from people who say, Terry, I stopped cutting myself because I found you on YouTube. Terry, I started a business because I read your book. Or Terry, I got born again. I was an atheist for 20 years and I got born again because I saw your podcast. I think somebody was waiting on me to start a podcast. Who could be waiting on you to start investing in yourself? Because your obedience is going to impact their life. So if God's speaking to you today, do it, right? Just do it. Now, real quick, I do want to bless these girls. I think we can give them these products because we're not going to take them back, right? Do we have one extra one out there? This is all you got? So when it's over, can you give them that? Okay, we'll sort it when we get there. Okay. Y'all are so pretty. Okay, where's the precious girl that drove six hours? I do want to give you this because, oh my goodness. Yay, thank you, thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. You are trying to Thank you, Jesus. So, beautiful girls, we're going to bless you too. Don't, okay. So, did y'all enjoy today? Yes. Y'all want to stand up and we'll pray and then I'll. Turn it back over. I sure love y'all. Let's just lift our hands to heaven. That's our universal sign of surrender, right? When the police arrest somebody, surrender, right? Mm -hmm. So let's surrender our past, our present, and our future to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for this opportunity to minister today. Lord, I thank you for every precious person who is here who had a heart open to receive what you're speaking to them. And Lord, you know my prayer. I'm declaring Joel 2.25 that you will restore the years that Satan stole. All the years that look like a big waste, they weren't wasted. Father, I declare it, Lord, that you all that time, it was all preparation for where you're taking them now. And so, Lord, we declare Amos 9.13 Things are going to happen so fast, their heads will swim. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.